My next guest on the What's Your Story documentary series is the one, the only, Stephen Parrish. Steve Parrish was Barry Sheen's best mate. He's done lots in motorsport and he continues to do more. This is the story of Steve Parrish. And if you want to hear some funny stories, then stick around because he's got a fair old view of them. And just before we get into it, please hit that subscribe and like button, share it with your friends, and let's get some really cracking guests on for the rest of this year and also for next year. The more subscribers this channel has, the better the guests will be. So please just show me that little bit of support, hit the subscribe button, hit the like button, and share it with all your mates, and let's get some cracking guests on this year and really blow up this channel. Thank you very much. I'm not going to bore you anymore. Let's get into it. This is What's Your Story with Steve Parrish. What does racing mean to me? Um, it's my life. Uh, I'm super competitive. Sometimes at things I'm not good at, which is annoying because I hate losing. Uh, but m for me, life's a race. Life's competitive. And it just annoys me when people said, you know, oh, well, I couldn't do this because someone else did that. Well, be better than them. That's, and that was racing to me. And my life has continued racing. And I found this out very soon after I packed up racing. I hung my leathers up in 1986, went on to run a team. Well, running a team's competitive. It's racing as well. You've got to be better than the next team manager. You've got to have one jump in front of them. Packed up doing them, went truck racing. It, obviously, it was racing just the same. Packed up, went commentating, went presenting, doing things. That's a race because there's always someone trying to get into your shoes. And if you're not good at what you're doing, that someone else comes along will do it better than you, also do it cheaper than you. So for me, racing is my life. It always has been and always will be. Um, and I want to be the fastest hearse uh, when I'm going to my burial ground. I'm sure I will. I, I, I'm convinced about it. Um, I actually, I know it sounds morbid and this is ridiculous. I want to be at my funeral because I've got a fart machine in the, in the coffin where I'm going to let a fart out when I go in there. And I've even got a microphone little ding dong when the old goes into the burn a bit so it's going to be real good fun if you get a chance come to my funeral it'll be a real giggle good question who am i uh, what do i do what have i achieved um, i guess i'm going to answer that firstly by saying what do i do i am now 48 and a half years without a proper job which i'm extremely proud of so that's what i do is keep out of a proper job but who am I? I am Stephen James Parrish, born in 1953, where upon I read recently that was a good year to be born, 1953, because the war was over, we all had enough food, and I proved that by being a fat little bastard when I was young. Um, so I grew up near where we are now, which is on the borders of Hertfordshire and Cambridgeshire. Uh, was a horrible little child. Um, I really was a fat little bastard that went to the village primary school um, and I ate too much. I think I had an overactive knife and fork. I was born with that, I think. Um, and I went to the village primary school and was a little terror. Um, my poor old dad passed away when I was 12, so I didn't really have a father to kind of keep me in line as much as they probably should have done. Um, but anyway, uh, that my end, of, end of my primary school was 10. It should have been 11, but I got expelled at 10, so I never got around to doing the 11 plus, which was around in those days for writing Mrs. Wilson is a fat old cow, who was my headmistress, on the school wall in quite big letters. Um, and I spelt it right and everything, so I don't know why they expelled me. But anyway, the village Bobby came round to my, my mum, who'd got some friends round and um, sort of made my mum and her friends go round and paint it all out. Um, and that was the end of my primary school. I then went to senior school uh, in Cambridge, actually, not to one of these kind of colleges where uh, bright, educated people go. It was kind of a small school that they managed to take me and that lasted till I was 15 because I used to play truancy all the while, mainly to come home to ride motorbikes. I just had this fascination with engines and it didn't have to be a motorbike, it could be a car, it could be anything that had an engine. I just love speed and scaring the shit out of myself. Anyway, that my, my main sort of education, um, primary education came to a halt at 15 and that was for taking the wheel nuts off my geography teacher, Mr Carruthers, his name was, wheel nuts off his Triumph Herald that he parked in the car park. And I diligently put his hubcaps back on so he didn't know his wheel nuts weren't on there. And I got all my mates to watch and at four o'clock he went to go home. And it was very fucking funny because um, his wheels all fell off. So that was the end of my schooling. But I really didn't like school. I hated it. But I actually did lose weight. And I genuinely was a fat little thing when I was sort of 10, 11, 12. But once I got into my passion, which was engine, speed, going fast, um, I lost that weight. And I still have, 
on the back of my crash helmet. To this day, I have a picture of an elephant on the back of him because my nickname at school was Jumbo because I was such a porky little thing. But that all went away um, when I found this passion of, of speed. Um, so what do I do? Well, actually, as soon as I left school, uh, or was expelled from school, I did an agricultural engineering apprenticeship, working at a local company in Royston um, as a tractor mechanic, pretty much. It's now called agricultural engineering, but really I laid under tractors and gone top of tractors, mending clutches and brakes and engines. And that lasted about three years. Um, but by then, maybe four years, um, I then started doing jobs on the side, as everyone did. You know, you got pound notes and cash to go and mend someone's tractor, and then I could weld up someone's car, and then I could respray someone's car. So I set, set up my own little business, actually, at my mother's base with a garage there where I would fix other people's vehicles and cars. So I kind of started my own business up. But at the same time, along with a very good group of friends, um, we decided, and I was riding a bike on the road by then, I was 16 years old, had 250 Yamaha that I've got parked around the corner, a little um, YDS3 Yamaha, riding on the road, and I got to go to the village pub or pub that was nearby, and there was a bunch of guys there that were also petrol heads like me, love motorbikes, and I think, truthfully, the reason we like motorbikes is because A, you could have one when you were 16 and you couldn't have a car till you were 17, B, motorbikes were generally cheaper than cars, so that was where we ended up, and we'd tear around the roads like lunatics. How I didn't hurt myself and kill myself on the roads, I don't know. Um, you've got to remember, back in those days, you didn't even wear a crash helmet. Flying around on little 250 Yamahas and things like that. Ended up in hedges and whatever you did, but luckily didn't, didn't die doing it. But we decided that it made sense, and everyone around us was saying, look, boys, if you're going to go this fast, go to a racetrack. So we did. We got together, and one of the lads at the pub that I knew... Uh, had a lawnmower repair business, one had a paint spraying business, one had an engineer, was involved in engineering. So between us we had all these skills. The guy that did the lawnmowers had some money, the paint sprayer was handy, the machinist was handy for making things. We actually built a bike in my garage and it was a 650 or well, I can't remember, I think it was supposed to be a 500cc Triumph but we cheated by putting a 650cc engine in it built this Manx frame, put some brakes on it, and it was absolute rubbish. I went to Brands Hatch with my mates, and it was just just fun, it was a giggle. We'd set off at five o'clock in the morning because we never knew if the van was ever gonna get there because it used to break down all the while. Um, and and just it was just a giggle. Anyway, I went out and I finished second from last on this Triumph, and it pissed oil everywhere. We was known as porous racing because we was poor as piss and the Triumph was like the ter Torrey Cannon. It poured oil out everywhere. So, But it was a giggle. We didn't care. We, ate, you know, we drank beer afterwards and giggled and laughed and came home. But we eventually, after about three or four races, realised that the old Triton wasn't going to be good enough. The lawnmower man bought me a better Triton and I started showing a bit of promise, getting nearer and nearer the front. But realistically, my whole world turned around when I bought this, a little TD2B Yamaha off of a club racer called Roger Keane. He was doing really well in club racing, amateur, Bemsey, Newmarket and District, Snetterton Brands, Cabell. So I thought the best thing I'd do is see if I was any good by buying a bike that was already good. Um, and I proved that I was because I went out and pretty much wiped the floor with it. I won nearly all the races that year, won the club championship at Newmarket and Bemsey. In fact, the guy that Roger Keane that sold it to me went on to buy a later model, a water-cooled model, and first race I beat him on his old bike. So um, it was a great moment. So I guess my life turned around at that point, and this would have been a 1973 stroke 74 when I realised I could win amateur racing. wasn't making any money. In fact, I was still working hard, bodging up people's cars for MOTs and spraying them and things like that, just to scrape enough money together to go racing really and that that changed my life and I was very fortunate as I think you've got to be at times because I got some backing and support some odd people put money into me and, and helped me get through things and and soon after that uh, I won the Grovewood Award which was the most promising up-and-coming rider of that decade and there was lots of great riders around then um, so I won that of that year, and I think that was 1976. Um, I won the Castrol Award for the most promising ride, all sorts of things. But I think they probably made a mistake, because arguably I wasn't the most. I did all right, but there was other riders that were probably equally as good. So the answer to your question, who am I? As I said, a farmer's son, really. That's what I probably should have been. 
um, and ended up racing from being involved in well, bike racing, truck racing, you name it. Um, and and yeah, that's that's how it all came about. And and the, you know, I was at times you come to crossroads in your life, and there's probably four roads to take, and you've got to try and choose the right one. I think generally, I pretty much chose the right one and ended up making a living out of a sport. And you're a very lucky person when you can make a living out of your hobby. And and I did, and I have, and I'm now just turned 70 years old. Uh, with a brain of a 14-year-old, apparently, or a mind of a 14-year-old, according to my wife. Never really grew up, but I've had a fantastic life, and I'd like to think there's a few more years left. What do I enjoy most about racing and the whole deal of being involved? I think, if I told the truth, um, the, the adrenaline you get from it, and I said early on, and some people find it hard to believe, but if I talk to other riders and racers and people in, in, in other things in life, that I love doing things that are a bit dangerous, and it sounds daft, I get a great deal of, of adrenaline buzz from doing things that are what other people think are stupid. But to me, I think you have your own boundaries and you know what your abilities are and you can do that. I love the excitement that goes with it. Looking back, I love that I've met so many wonderful people because it does open up lots of doors. When you've, you know, I won a couple of Brit three British championships and ended up fifth in the World Championship, I had a teammate of Barry Sheen met Giacomo Agostini and raced against them and all these famous people. I've ridden Valentino Rossi's bikes, I've met Valentino and you just move around in this world of meeting wonderful, talented, exciting people and doing wild things. And so there's, a, there's an element of excitement comes from the fact that you're doing something that a lot of people don't get to do. And my life, I think, otherwise, without racing, would have been rather mundane. I'd have probably carried on going to the village pub in the darts team or football team or whatever it might have been, uh, and laying under cars and fixing them. So it, it opened up a whole new life to me. My first ever trip on an aeroplane was going to the Venezuelan Grand Prix in 1977. And I was like a dog with four dicks, not two dicks. I mean, I really was. I was just mixing with all these wonderful people, traveling the world, um, and so it opened up a lot of avenues in my life and, and I think that applies to any sport. But don't get me wrong, I worked very hard at doing it. I, I, you know, I, I sacrificed lots of things, including probably a family life. It, it caused a divorce in my family because I was always away. Um, I still get on really well with my two children. I've got a daughter and a son. Um, but I, I've got lots of, I've got dodgy knees, broken collarbones, broken wrists, arms, lots of danger. Also, I have to factor into that, I lost lots of good friends. Probably 20 mates that I would call, wouldn't necessarily be English, but you know, I had lots of friends, Italian friends and German friends and French friends. So in my era of racing, bikes, which was pretty much professionally from 76 through to 86, 10 years, I lost an awful lot of friends and it was, tragic times and I busted myself up a lot, ended up waking up in hospitals wondering who I was at times with legs and arms sticking out in the wrong direction. But uh, you forget pain but you keep memories and so I've got some brilliant memories. The whole racing world has changed dramatically from my era uh, to the modern day era and it probably changed from going back previous to my era. I think I was still just on the cusp of what I call old school racing, particularly in motorcycle racing. I think car racing had moved on a great deal, Formula One and whatever, but in bike racing when I started out, and even my early professional years when I was a factory Suzuki rider, I still kept my bikes in my workshop at home. Um, I stripped my own engines down, I helped the mechanics, I got my hands dirty. I was mates with my mechanics, we lived together nearly, we travelled together. I would travel down to the, the Italian Grand Prix in a van and truck with my mechanics and crew and my girlfriend and everything else like that. So it was still very much <clears throat> a family, it was known as the Continental Circus. And we really were mates, all the guys that did it, because there would be, I mean the, the grids back in my days uh, would be 45 people and five or six on the front row and five or six on the back row, it was very congested. But out of those 50 people on the grid or 60 people on the grid, um, I would be mates with 20 of them. And it could be Corky Ballington, Dave Potter, Tom Heron, Jon Eckerold, a um, whole bunch of guys from all over the world, Barry Sheen, you name it. Um, we would travel around together, Mark Sow, Gary Lingham, Chris Guy, Keith Hewing, you know, all. We would travel around the world together with our vans and often caravans and we'd 
in between races, we'd park up at Lake Coma and have a good time and have a giggle and have barbecues and travel together. So it was very much a family. What I see now is completely the opposite because the Suzuki, well, they're not even in Grand Prix now, but the Yamaha team won't stay where the Honda team stays, that won't stay where the KTM is very much segregated. You are focused. Um, you don't do normal things that we did, like drive our trucks around, um, because most of the riders nowadays, from the age of or that, that height, six, eight years old, started riding bikes, probably some younger, ended up in an academy, ended up with a, a, a coach that would be someone that checks out their fitness levels, they would have a dietitian, they'd have a psychiatrist, or they do now, and they are nearly homogenized beings that are taken from a young kid traveling all the way through to what they are now. And they are world champions at 20, 22, 23. Most people in my era were, became world champions at 27, 28 because they'd had to, they didn't start till they were 16, 17, like I. So it's changed quite dramatically. I feel a bit for them. I don't feel for their bank balance because I think the majority that make it at the level I was at now are multimillionaires because they are, there's so much commercialism around, but they're certainly not gonna have the fun that I had because everyone's got a phone, there's Instagram, there's Facebook, there's Twitter, there's TikTok, everything going on, where they are scrutinized and watched at a level. They say, you know, if, if they fart, someone films it. If they say anything, you get fired. It's horrible in some ways. So I am pleased to have been in the era that I was in. I did okay, don't get me wrong. Financially, I did very well out of it, but not to the level they're doing now but I had an awful lot of fun doing it. And that's where the memories come from. I'm not sure if, if you said to Pecco Bagnaia now, how much fun did you have at Silverstone? Uh, I'm sure he had a lot by winning it and he's got the trophy to say it and he's got the bonus to say it, but he would have gone from his hotel into the track in the morning and he'd have been with his dietitian, his psychiatrist and his fitness instructor and he'd have put on his leathers and he'd have looked at the data and the engineer would have done that and he'd have pressed this button, pressed that button, checked the tires, gone out and won the race. Well. It was just vastly different to that. We probably would have all stayed at the track together. We'd have had a barbecue the night before, maybe one too many beers, but who gives a shit? And that was how it was. So it was much more friendly, but as I said before, much more tragic. I think the fun element's gone out of racing, um, but it's also probably gone out of football, tennis, golf, every sport you can think about it. It's not so much of a fun event now because there was so much commercialism, there's so much focus required. Um, and I'm not blaming these kids that come up from eight years old because I think if they didn't come up from eight years old, they wouldn't make it to the level they're at now because you're competing against the others. You know, you have to work hard at it and, and train a great deal and do all these things. Um, yeah, so I don't think it probably is a lot of fun now. And it certainly doesn't look it when you look at the interviews and everything else. You know, I'd like to thank my, you know, my helmets and leathers and the tyres were good and my engineer was good and so on. So it's still a team, don't get me wrong, but I doubt and I might be very wrong on this, some of the kind of riders wouldn't have a clue who the people are behind them, Work, sitting per, particularly working back at the factory, building their engines and doing this and the suspension and so on and so on. They are a team, but they're not really mates, if you know what I mean. So it, in, to me, it's taken some of the fun out of it. Um, I mean, it'd be great fun when you look at your bank balance, and it'd be great fun standing on top of that podium. That part of it is fun. I often thought when I was racing, and I might have been different to others. I didn't particularly like the racing. I like having done the race. And I think that's a bit like someone going to the gym. They don't like turning up and going to the gym, but they enjoy what it gives them afterwards. You know, the effort that you put in gives you something back. And, th and that's the same in racing. I love the kind of adulation that you got. I love going around on the back of the truck at the end and people waving and clapping at you. And yeah, maybe a bit egotistical. Um, certainly selfish because you are the end product and all those people behind you, even though you're your mates, don't get to go around and waving at the crowd of people and things like that. So I always felt that that would be nice if they could be slightly more involved. So I can't imagine now being a top sportsman in any sport now is a great deal of fun, but I guess that uh, you can have a wonderful life if you treat it nicely and if you don't hurt yourself too much at the end of it. And that's something that you have to factor in. A lot of careers come to an end because of injury. Mine, I decided uh, at the age of 32, and I still was able to walk and talk and do all the other things, uh, and I've decided it was time for me to call it a day and have a family, um, and I got out of it reasonably well, and was able to go on to do other things after my motorcycle racing career. The biggest highlight of my career is massively difficult, because I've had massive highlights 
you know, you could say, what was it like in 2000, 2001, whatever, whatever, whatever. I don't think there's one enormous highlight that stands out. I mean, winning championships is great. Um, my career went on to truck racing and I won five world championships doing that. I, I don't think I've got an answer to that because I think the greatest achievement for me was having a wonderful life, doing great things and being able to continue that on. Um, that journey of my life, as I said, 48 and a half years without doing a proper job, that's really a lie because I've worked very, very hard. So it is really a job, but I never treated it as a job. But I've just meeting wonderful people and famous people. I mean, let's face it, 1978, I was sponsored by George Harrison from the Beatles and I'd go around to George's house and he'd be kind of a mate. And that to me was quite ridiculous to be able to do that. And, and you know, I've got to meet wonderful people, you know, like your Valentino Rossi's and like your Formula One drivers and your Damon Hills. And they've all become friends and I'll be seeing them all at Goodwood next week at the event down there. And, and so I feel very privileged to have done something in my life that's enabled me to meet all these incredible people. So to me, I think the highlight of my life is I've moved from being a country bumpkin, farmer's son, tractor mechanic, to be somebody that's able to meet all these incredibly talented people. Um, and, and I'd put that above winning races, winning championships. To me, I think it's a rounded part of my life that I'm very happy. I'm also very happy because I've got a great wife now. First one wasn't quite as good as I expected. Um, and I've got two wonderful children and I've got great friends all around me. And now my life's moved on. My friends aren't necessarily involved in the racing. I've kind of branched out and met people. And again, some of those people would have been from the past in racing. Um, but, you, you know, I'm still still very fortunate to be able to live a wonderful, comfortable life in a lovely area, have a holiday house and a boat and an aeroplane and all the trappings that go with it. So I guess I look back on my broken legs and arms and bangs on the head that go with it and it's all made sense because it's given me a wonderful life afterwards. People call me a practical joker, I don't know about that, it kind of sounds like I'm going to come out with a flipping rabbit out of my sleeve or something, but I've just always kind of pushed the boundaries of getting into trouble a bit, I guess you'd say, um, and enjoyed the fun and frivolities that go with it. And I, I actually do enjoy making people laugh. Sometimes I make people cry, well, no, sometimes I annoy people, I know. Um, and there's been some massively complicated pranks that have gone on over the years, but I don't know if any real standout, I mean, I, I, I giggle about lots of them, I still do, you know. I actually get to laugh about some of the things I've got up to as much by people reminding me, and they were perhaps involved with it in one way or another, where things have gone wrong. Uh, one of the things that I was, it was stupid of me to do, but I pretended to be an aer a, a, be a doctor on an aeroplane because I, the, the flight was going to get delayed. John Hopkins was crashed at the Japanese Grand Prix, 2006 I think it was, and they were going to chuck him off the plane because he got broken ribs and they didn't want him to fly because the British Airways flight was policy not to fly people with broken ribs because of the pressure changes and I knew that we were going to get delayed if they threw him off because his luggage was going to come off and I got my crew, which was Belinda Rogerson from BBC, Charlie Cox, Susie Perry, Matt Roberts, all sat together. We, luckily, they flew us business class, and Hopkins was shouting and screaming. And I thought the only thing to do is say that I was a doctor and I'd examined and he was all right. And I thought they'd never find out. Well, they got real serious. The captain came down and wanted proof that I was a doctor. Um, and luckily, all my business cards got Steve Parrish on, and they've also got letters after them, NLAMN and PhD. Well, N-L-A-M-N stands for no letters after my name because I've never got any, but I always have it printed because it looks like I've got a title. Um, and PhD uh, stood for Pizza Hut Delivery because I did a bit of that. So it looked like I was a doctor. And they let, they let us go because the captain made me sign this document saying I was a doctor and John Hopkins was fine to fly, which was all going really well until they had a problem on the aeroplane. And the per cabin director comes to me as a doctor and wants me to go and fix someone that's got a problem <laughs> back in the plane. <laughs> So then I'm thinking, oh shit, my producer at BBC was not impressed at all. She was going off on one. Susie Perry nearly wet herself laughing because Parrish was finally in big trouble. But luckily for me, all it was down the back of the plane, they got a drunk and they needed a doctor to certify this guy was drunk so they could have him thrown off. Spanish fella uh, at Heathrow Airport. And, and I'm explaining to the cabin director that orthopaedics <laughs> were my thing. <laughs> anyway, got away with it. I did get away with it, but I shit myself, I have to say. 
Uh, we ended up, Barry Sheen and I ended up landing a helicopter at Gatwick Airport, main airport, transiting through, and the helicopter started rattling. We were going to his house, which was near Gatwick, and May Day, well, it should have been May Day, but Barry was shouting on the flipping uh, radio transmission, fucking hell, we're coming down, because this helicopter was rattling away and all it was was my seatbelt hanging out the door and so we shut Gatwick Airport down for three hours for that. Um, I've um, blown up toilets uh, in Finland, didn't mean to, set fire to toilets in Finland because they were disgusting uh, but forgot and this was Sheeny again, it was his idea actually, the whole thing blew apart because we forgot about the methane gas and it blew the toilet roof onto the flipping lake that you had to wear a cap to go swimming in. It just go, you know, it goes on really. But I got people got me back in the end, and 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 to start with, I wasn't really impressed. Beatles about got me. I was on Beatles about. They rang up on London Weekend Television and said we got this knob. This was the local landlord, because I used to own a fire engine, and I went and hosed his pub out, and he wasn't really impressed, as you can imagine, pretending to be a fire brigade, um, and. Uh, he got London Weekend Television to come and do a Beatles about him. He set me up properly. My whole workshops were being, when I dro drove back, it was a NATO exercise and they were blowing up my workshops. And it did look like they were. There was explosions going off everywhere and I'm effing and blinding and they've all got guns and shit like that. It was a proper NATO exercise. So they got me back properly on that one. But yeah, just little little pranks maybe. I still get people now actually, I shouldn't be telling you this, but sometimes, sometimes and I got Sheeny with it actually, uh, you get a visitor come round, particularly if they've got electric windows and most cars have now, and get the keys when they're having a cup of tea and wind the window down. And then I've, in my garage, I've always got broken glass and I lay all the broken glass on the seat with a brick and say, oh God, sorry about it. We've had some gypsy problems around there and someone's probably tried to break in your car. And I'll lend them the bloody plastic foil or whatever, you know, the cling film stuff and they put it all over their window and everything else and they go to the local local windscreen people and they check, take the panel off and it's just wound down. But it does look good with all the broken glass over the seat. So little things like that still make me giggle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It can go on. There's hundreds and hundreds of them. Um, but I've never really, really upset anyone too much, I think. They think at the end of the day, most people think it's quite funny. But I've calmed down because, same thing, you can't do too much these days because people film you and or woke. Don't get me on woke, I just had enough of it. Honest to God I have, just live your life and just be normal as you can. And if you're not gonna be normal, go and be unnormal somewhere else. I don't wanna know about it. If you like what you're hearing, then please hit that subscribe and like button and share this with your mates. The more subscribers this channel has, the better the guests are going to be. So if you like the interactions I have with people, and want to see better guests on the channel and more guests more frequently, then please hit that subscribe and like button and share it with your mates and let's blow up this channel. Thank you very much. Let's get back into it. What do I relax with? That's difficult. I'm not a good relaxer, but, um, and, and a lot of people will laugh and giggle at this because it's an old man's thing. And I am an old man. I, the, one of my problems is I might have a 14 year old mind, but I've got a 70 year old body and I can't do the things I used to do. And I used to love riding motocross bikes and trials bikes. I used to love doing all sorts of things, but just physically I can't do them anymore now. So I play golf and I'm quite into my golf. Uh, I play tennis. So I've got a bunch of guys and there's a village near here called Wendy, the village of Wendy. And one of the, there's eight of us in this kind of group. And a few of them have got tennis courts. I don't have one anymore. I used to have one at my old house before I got divorced. Um, but it's a village called Wendy and we're known as the Wendy Wankers Tennis Club. We're not affiliated to Wimbledon, you won't be surprised to hear, but we play tennis twice a week, so I still do that. I'm still physically just about able to do that. Um, I like going to my holiday place in Mallorca where I have a boat and I've got friends out there. Um, so I kind of holiday a fair bit, but I am going to be riding at Goodwood shortly. I think that's going to be my last ever motorcycle race. I might, I'm still able to parade bikes, but competitively, physically, I can't move around. So, And I don't like riding around being back of the pack if you know you just it's embarrassing so i'm going to do a race and i'm really pleased to say it's going to be sharing a bike with freddie sheen barry's son um and it's 20 years since barry sheen passed away so it's kind of nice fitting and nice tribute to barry because it's called the barry sheen trophy event at goodwood i'm going to ride with his son and that's the end of my racing so uh, relaxing wise golf tennis enjoying time with friends, watching racing, I still enjoy that. I still do a bit of commentary work. I love doing commentary work now, but I'm well aware 
I'm probably got a blue sticker on me now. I'm at the end of my, you know, sell by dates come up. Thoroughly enjoyed working at the TT, don't do that anymore. Still do some stuff for BBC Northern Ireland doing the Northwest 200. I'll be going to South Africa uh, beginning of next year and have been for the last four or five years for the South African Classic TT where I do commentary there and do parades for them. So uh, love parading a two-stroke, uh, particularly something like an RG500, which I've got a few of them. So enjoy that, enjoy golf, tennis, mixing with friends and generally keeping in touch with racing. And I still know a lot of the racing guys now. I could, I'm Generally, if I'm talking about them, I'm old enough to be their grandfather probably, uh, but a lot of the guys like Leon Haslam and people like that, um, I used to race with their dads and, and you know, so I still keep abreast of it all do a column in a magazine, Fast Bike magazine. So I never ever stop loving motorcycle racing, um, but I have a different life now. Tragedies um, and, and, and times when you want to chuck it all in and do something normal. And that, that kind of feeling came to me pretty much every time I sat on the grid at the TT, because I'd be sat on the grid at the TT. I've been to the toilet four times, um, crapping myself. Uh, thinking, what the hell am I doing this for? And it, it, that would arise on, you know, whether it's sometimes brands hatched on to my activity, it's pouring with rain, Northwest 200, you're thinking, what the hell am I doing this for? And then someone gets killed and, and some close friends got killed. One of the biggest tragedies, I guess you'd say, in my early part of my racing was 1977. A previous teammate to me was a lad called Mick Patrick, a lovely fella from Oxfordshire. Um, and I kind of witnessed his death, I guess you'd say, to a certain extent. Um, and he was a really close friend to me, as was his girlfriend. And that feeling when I left the paddock and his truck and caravan was just left parked there and he was no longer with us. Um, and you, you're thinking, what am I doing this for? Because I'm, you know, I could be not scared and worried about that. Uh, but it's amazing when you're passionate about something, no matter what anyone puts in front of you, you blink yourself away from it. And I did. Um, another terrible tragedy was when Barry Sheen passed away, um, 2003, uh, and, and it was 2002. I had a phone call from Barry, he was living in Australia, saying, Stavros, you'll not believe this. And pe for people who don't know, my nickname is Stavros. came from Barry Sheen, uh, and it came from Barry Sheen because he found out I was a fat little kid that I spoke about earlier on. I also had big curly hair. Then there was a bloke in Kojak called Stavros that had curly hair. So I became a fat bloke with curly hair and that was Stavros. So that's how it came about. Anyway, he phoned me up 2002, said, you're not believe this, I've, been, I've got cancer. I go, Jesus, you know, what is it? And he goes, it's cancer of the esophagus and that's part of your throat here. Probably wasn't helped by the fact that he smoked 20 or 30, 40 gall wires every day of his life, most of the time. He had packed up by then. He'd realized that it wasn't good for you, probably a bit too late. Um, anyway, I said, well, are you going for the operation? And he said, no, I'm not. I'm uh, going to go to Mexico and there's this guy that's got this potion that's going to fix it. And he went all over the place. Pretty much everyone that knew him closely, like I did, suggested it and pretty much said, for God's sake, go and have an operation they can fix you. No, no, I've got it sorted out. And I understood Barry a lot and he had so much belief in himself, so much self-belief. I'm sure he believed that motorbikes didn't kill him and he had tried a lot of times you know had some huge accidents and cancer wasn't going to get him well we all know now history proves that it did get him um, and it was horrible to see him kind of just being eaten away by this disgusting sickening disease that's touched everyone's life there wouldn't be a person out there that hasn't met someone knows someone got a relation that's had it i traveled to australia after i was tipped off by a good mate of mine and had seen him a month or so before he passed away. If you want to see Barry again, go out there. And that was probably one of the hardest things in my life, seeing your, and he was my hero. He was my mate, he was my hero. He was like my brother, nearly like my father, because when I first met him, he took me under his wing and helped me a great deal when I started riding Grand Prix. To see this poor bloke being eaten up by him. And I left Barry Sheen three weeks before he passed away in Australia and I cried all the way home from Australia, which is a bloody long time because it's a 24 hour trip. And, and that was one of the saddest days of my life um, in the fact that this bloke that I thought was infallible, he was indestructible, got eaten up by this disgusting disease. And so I do everything I can now to support cancer campaigns and everything like that. Um, that was tragic. Um, but also I've had, even watching and seeing people, I love the TT, but I also hate it because I've had friends killed there, David Jeffries and, and you know, more recently, p people that I know and, and loved 
uh, getting killed. So it's a kind of love-hate relationship. And that's what goes with the territory of motorcycle racing, I guess you'd say. It's horrible, but it's lovely. Um, I guess I also feel more for relations and wives and kids and people like that that sit there watching. I'm really pleased my son didn't want to go motorcycle racing. He rode a bike around the fields, uh, but if someone turned up with a football, he went that direction. And I used to go, that would do me, because I didn't really want to be hanging over the pit wall watching, watching my son racing around motorbikes. So there's been lots and lots of tragedies in my life, but ah, of all I would, you know, it's, it's horrible, but um, it just goes with the territory. So I still get excited about watching motorcycle racing, but I'm very sad when someone gets killed, or worse still, probably, I think I feared being in a wheelchair maybe more than I did dying, because I didn't know where the dying was going to hurt. I knew being in a wheelchair would, for me and the family and the inconvenience of it all. When Barry passed away, no, we, we'd both got, prior to his illness, we'd both kind of survived. I was, um, I'd finished racing trucks even. I, after my bike racing career, my, I had 10 years of racing trucks, but I was now into media, I guess you'd say, because at the time I was working for BBC. I'd given, well, truck racing come to an end for me, Mercedes stopped, um, and I was working for BBC. Again, living, living the dream, traveling around the world. Kind of in some ways, my commentary career of pretty much 10 years was the highlight in some ways, because I was traveling around doing all the Grand Prix, watching all these superstars, um, and not going to hospital. <laughs> that was the upside to it all. And, and Barry was pretty much doing the same. He was working for Channel 10 in Australia. He was coming over, doing events with me. We'd go off to do, sometimes Oliver's Mount, get invited up there, get invited to the Northwest 200, and I'd go along with him doing events without all the pain and, and that went with the racing side. So having a great, great time of it all. But yeah, I was involved in my commentary career at that time and he was the same. Um, so that was what made it even worse because I couldn't believe that Barry Sheen was going to die of cancer. I believed that if we were going to die, it'd be going, you know, it'd be crash and burn in a ball of flames. So um, it just seemed all very, very wrong at that point that that should happen. But my commentary career was, I really loved that because I got at the time to race all the Grand or ride all the Grand Prix bikes at the end of the year. We'd get to ride the Suzuki, the Kawasaki, the Yamaha, the Honda, you name it. I'd be traveling around the world, uh, mixing and seeing all, all these wonderful superstar racers, knowing a lot of the engineers and the mechanics and everything else. And, and I loved that side of it because I like the technical side of seeing the the bikes progress from the bikes I've got behind me here, my RG 500s, the only thing that's electric on them is a the spark plug, that was it. Nowadays there's flipping laptops and computers and everything else, but I did enjoy seeing that side of it because I'm jumping around a bit. When I was racing trucks, I got very much involved in data logging, which is what bikes have, it, we call it telemetry, but it's not proper telemetry, it's data logging, because you have to plug into the bike to download what's going on. But I got heavily involved with that in my truck racing with the factory Mercedes team. And so I saw all that coming coming along and, and I still enjoy it now. I mean, people say, ah, oh, it's all electronic now and it's easy. It's not easy riding a bike at the lap times they do. There's still lots going on and you've still got to be very, very talented, very, very brave, very committed to what you're doing. You sure you get some traction control and you get this and you get that, but it hasn't made it any easier. Going fast on what you've got is still very, very difficult. The upside now of modern day racing is that you're less likely to kill yourself. You've got great protective gear with airbag suits, great helmets, boots, gloves and everything else. More importantly, you've got big runoff areas. Speed never killed anyone is stopping quickly. That's what kills you. And sadly that happens sometimes when a bike runs into you or someone else's bike goes in. But yeah, uh, I've sort of lost the plot a little bit there as to what we were talking about, but I think it's an oversight to what's gone on in, in my life. Yeah, how, how to get in racing now? Um, is it harder, is it more difficult now than it was when I'm doing it? I don't know really, that's a very pointed question. I think the unfortunate thing about getting into racing now, and that must apply to uh, lots of sports, and, and I keep going on about golf and tennis and one or two things, maybe soccer slightly different, but I think, sadly, you have to possibly come from a privileged family because it's expensive. So that kind of, uh, I spoke about crossroads earlier on, which crossroads do you take? You've got to be very committed to do it. But if you don't come from a privileged family, you've got to probably get a good job to be able to go and do it. And by the time you've done that, you're too old to make it to the top because everyone wants a, a kid. They want a youngster coming into it. So 
Um, yeah, and, and, and that does apply. And again, I've got a good mate that's got someone playing tennis and it's expensive doing that because again, they've got to go to academies, you've got to take them around doing things. I remember my, my kid, my son actually was a very good tennis player, but I was taking him all over the country to go and play tennis. If you, sadly, if you live in the back streets and you haven't got good finance if you and you can't even do that. So getting on that ladder is extremely difficult. The only thing I'll say now is that to go amateur club racing is probably easier because you can go out and buy a CBR 600 Honda or Suzuki, whatever, a road bike and go racing. When I started, you couldn't race a road bike because they were piles of shit. They were horrible things. And so you had to probably get something like this to go racing with or, or build a proper race bike. Whereas now you can actually take a road bike and go racing. But yeah, don't get me wrong. I think you probably have to come from a bit of a privileged family to get on that ladder in the first place or have some exceptional talent as a little kid riding around on a mini bike that someone spots. Same thing, right place, right time. It has to all fall into place. Um, it's harder, I think, for people in the UK. Maybe it's harder from Sweden, Finland, but what I'm saying is it's much easier if you're from Spain and Italy and what to all the sort of southern metro, um, Mediterranean areas because A, everyone rides scooters, everyone knows about motorbikes because of the weather's that much better. Uh, you can ride scooters at the age of 14 years old and it's acceptable, whereas over here, majority of parents, and I'd probably be one of them, and you say to your kid, you're not having a motorbike at 16, but I'll buy you a car when you're 17. And so it's kind of a bit of a carrot to stop you getting on the road because it is dangerous, don't you? you know, I'm, I'm aware of that. Um, and so there's a lot of barriers to get past for kids of this country to get through, to get into racing. Um, and I, don't, I wouldn't even know where to start. You just have to try and persuade your dad to probably earn enough money, if he can, to try and get you on that ladder, if your dad is brave enough to allow you to do that, because that's the other side of it. So you'll find more and more, dads used to do a bit of racing, didn't probably make it, want their son to try and do it, and they'll do everything they can to, to allow that. But for me, nobody in my family was ever into racing. I got a little bit of help from my mum, where she lent me a few bob to go and buy this bike. Other than that, it was just a bit of uh, hard graft, natural talent that I clearly had some of, um, and a bit of luck down the road as well. So those, those factors, it's like a, you know, it's a bit like a cheese. You've got to place all those things together and they've all got to line up and hopefully you can make it. But not easy, and it's not easy in any sport because the level is so high now. The ideal thing for me in racing um, would possibly, it's so difficult. I, I wear two hats here. I want to, like everyone else, I love watching motorcycle racing and the battles that go on and the, the tuck, ducking and diving and, and I like seeing the bikes go sideways and smoke coming off the tyres and everything else like that. But I don't think we're ever going to see that again because a lot of people, and I am very passionate about racing and so many people that watch it are, and they all think that racing is about racing. Well, we have to realise in the commercial world we live on. The only reason racing takes place, motorcycle racing I'm talking about now, the only reason it takes place is because the manufacturers support it at the top level. Yamaha, Honda, Suzuki, Kawasaki, Ducati, KTM, Aprilia, they go racing to sell motorcycles, right? Why are they gonna, I mean, the ideal situation was get a 990 four cylinder bike that's got 220 horsepower, put the great rise on, watch them spinning the tires and doing this, and sliding here, there and everywhere. But they're gonna have electronics on because every bike that you go and buy now, if you go to the local Ducati, KTM, Aprilia, Suzuki, Yamaha, Honda work showroom, buy a bike, it will have electronics on it. Why does it have electronics on it? Because it makes it safer. Those electronics are developed in the racing world. So you're hardly likely to be a manufacturer to spend millions and millions of pounds going racing with something that is not used for development. A lot of the budgets come from the development side and that electronics that you get on your new R1 Yamaha or new Ducati V4 has all been derived and developed in racing. So I can't see it ever going away from it. Racing is still good, but raw racing has gone um, and it went in years ago in Formula One and more and more aerodynamics are coming in. And I remember thinking, and lots of people shouted and screaming, why do they want them big wings on it? It's ridiculous. It will never be used on the road. Go and buy a new bike now. It's got wings on it. Those wings do jack shit on the road, certainly round the roundabouts at the speed everyone's going, but they look like the bike that is on television that Ducati is racing and spending millions on to sell their bike. So it all comes back from the racing. So if someone said, right, you can't do electronics, you can't have wings, you can't have that, if I was Yamaha, Honda, Suzuki, Kawasaki, I'd pack up and go home. 
There'd be no reason for it because the budget comes from the manufacturers. A bit like oil companies, it doesn't show as much, but the reason oil companies spend a load of money on racing is because it tests all their products. The tyre companies are the same. Bridgestone, Michelin, all those people out there, Michelin and MotoGP, uh, it costs them millions and millions of pounds to go racing, but they develop a better product that goes on the road that people pay lots of money for, for the bikes, for the cars and everything else. So you have to think here in a bigger picture than we want to see racing as it was. It can't ever happen again. Do I think we'll end up with full electric racing cars, motorbikes? If they do, I won't be watching it. I'm sorry, but I love the smell and the noise that goes with it. I'd like to think, and I'm sure it'll happen because I don't think electric's the answer to anything, frankly. It might be the answer for the moped going down and delivering your pizza or expresses or whatever, but I think someone will come up with a fuel that will make internal combustion engines work because for me, there'll never be an infrastructure in this country in my lifetime, certainly there, you can have an electric car. And you talk about range anxiety, I would certainly have it. I've got a car outside that I can jump in it, fill it up and I can drive it to Scotland and I won't have to stop for whatever, whatever and queue up to get electric plugging in and everything else. Um, and in racing, for me, for sure, the smell and the noise and everything that goes with it is what attracts me to it. There is racing on now. I've never ever watched a sing apart from the class, uh, the TT Zero, which is now finished. I used to watch a bit of that because I was working there and I had to, but I wouldn't have, if I chose, I wouldn't. I've never watched a Formula E, I've never watched Moto E or whatever it might be. Doesn't interest me in the slightest. Don't get me wrong, it's great technology, but it's not for racing as far as I'm concerned. I want to have that smell of fuel and the kind of sound that goes with it and everything. So no, certainly not for me. And it's certainly not for me uh, for, as a road vehicle. I don't think, I think it's a waste of time. The, the depreciation values on electric cars are falling like you can't believe. And I don't know, just, I'm an old school petrol head and I'm afraid that's where I'm always going to be. Uh, what does the future bring, for, uh, what is the future for Steve Parrish? Well, it won't be for that long because I said I'm getting older, but I don't feel old apart from, you know, having achy legs and things like that. I still love doing, I've just finished doing 10 years of my theatre show, which was called The Mad Tour. It started off originally hosted by my daughter, who kind of interviewed me, not just in what's going on here now. Um, and the reason it was called The Mad Tour, because it stood for my adolescent dad. Uh, um, and then my daughter moved away with her partner to live and husband now to live in Geneva, left me high and dry without a host. So my wife started doing it. I mean, we kept the MAD, the MAD, and it stood for my arsehole darling then. Um, but it was hugely successful. I love doing it. I love entertaining. I love doing theatre shows. So the future will be in 2024. I'm going to be starting another show up in conjunction with Henry Cole, who does the motorbike show and find it, fix it, flog it, whatever. Um, we're going to travel around doing that, which I think will be an awful lot of fun. I love um, opening and hosting events. I'm going to be doing something for BSA shortly where they've got a, a classic uh, festival, the, the Classic Bike Fest. Um, I will be going to uh, the motorcycle show at the NEC, Motorcycle Live. I host the stage activities there. So I still enjoy doing things. I do after dinner stuff. I love doing that because generally it makes people smile and giggle and laugh and think what an immature prat I've been. And they're right. Um, so entertainment really is what Steve Parrish will be from now on in. I do enjoy work. I would, I talked about tennis and golf and things. I'd hate to only do that like some people do. I love interspersing that with going out, doing shows, entertaining things, being involved. And yeah. Being Steve Parrish opens lots of doors. I've got a good following on social networking. I get to do events because people want me to uh, advertise what I'm up to. Um, so it does open up a lot of doors and at times gets me out of trouble. Gets me into trouble at times, but there are other occasions where it gets me out of trouble. So I enjoy being who I am. One, one funny story I think is that the guy that owns, and I do know him a little bit, is, uh, owns Crystal Palace Football Club, Premier Division Football Club, is called Steve Parrish people confuse me with this guy so I get emails coming from people that have bought season tickets for Crystal Palace Football Club and they're bitching and moaning about this and they can't see because there's a pillar in front and whatever whatever and I straight away email them back saying well you can use the director's box this weekend if you like and you can take two guests along and they must just queue up there and the real Steve Parrish looking wish you'd stop fucking doing that because there's all these people that I'm telling them. I've even had BBC turn up here wanting to interview me about my new team captain or something like that it's quite funny how but he's a single R which in my opinion is the common parish I'm a double R
Um, though I'm still having a lot of fun doing things, hopefully entertaining people, um, and hopefully can continue doing it for a few years longer. Racing is my life. It always has been and always will be. Um, and I want to be the fastest hearse uh, when I'm going to my burial ground. I'm sure I will. I, I, I'm convinced about it. Um, I actually, I know it sounds morbid and this is ridiculous. I want to be at my funeral because I've got a fart machine in the, in the coffin where I'm going to let a fart out when I go in there. And I've even got a microphone little ding dong when the old goes into the burner bit. So it's going to be real good fun. If you get a chance, come to my funeral. It will be a real giggle.